All right, I see people trickling in. Christine, I think we okay. could. Okay. All right. Namaste and Kiora. I'm Christine Maiden Sharp, the Chief Executive of the Aspen Institute in New Zealand. And together with our partner, Ananta Aspen, we're delighted to welcome you to the second of a series of dialogues between our two countries. Our purpose is to turbocharge the relationship by opening new channels for collaboration through the Institute's international network. In our forum today, Navigating the Digital Frontier, we aim to identify three takeaways that you, the audience, can run with. India Tech for New Zealand, two, New Zealand Tech for India, and three, innovative, innovative tech that needs to be scaled and brought to the world, which we can do together. So we're honored to have a distinguished panel from both New Zealand and India. We have Carmen Visilich and Amit Gupta from New Zealand and Arvind Gupta and Indrani Bakshi from India. Carmen Visilich is the CEO and founder of Velocity, Data Insight and Generate Zero and is transforming and democratizing the property valuation and selling process and data analytics globally. Amit Gupta is the group CEO and founder of Ecosystem Group, a next generation tech research and advisory platform, and is chair of TIE Singapore, the world's largest entrepreneur organization. Amit's based, a Kiwi based in Singapore and is on a mission to feed the world by leveraging agrarian technology. He'll tell you more about that later. Arvind Gupta is the head of the Digital India Foundation and is a founding member of iSpirit. He's a renowned leader in fintech globally, having worked extensively in digital commerce for decades in India in Silicon Valley, and now is devoted to open digital public infrastructure, and he will tell us all about India stack and more. Indrani Bakshi is my counterpart at Ananta Aspen Center and is an expert in foreign policy issues, having been the diplomatic editor of the Times of India for more than a decade. And moderating today is Priyana Buntra, the assistant director of Ananta Aspen, and she's leading the center's work on the relationship with India and US, as well as the technology sector. Now, Priyana will lead the conversation for the next 40 minutes when we'll open the floor to questions. So we encourage you to keep those questions coming through the chat line. Over to you, Priyona. Thank you, Christine. Well, firstly, on behalf of Ananta Aspen Center, thank you once again to you, to Pip, to the team at Aspen New Zealand for being absolutely wonderful collaborators and in helping bring together this very timely conversation on navigating the digital frontier together. Why is it timely though? Well, if you look up India, US, India, New Zealand relations, you'll notice a couple of things. Firstly, of course, you'll notice that uh, we play cricket a lot with each other. And this, I'm on a bound to just throw one thing in there, which is despite the greatness of some of your players like Williamson and Saudi and stuff, we still won the last two encounters at the World Cup. So that's a great sign. Let's keep that happening. But okay, more seriously, if you look up India, New Zealand relations, you'll notice that We've had a few bilateral conversations in the past year. The most recent one is when your trade minister was in India less than two months ago. And a number of things were brought up as potential areas of cooperation. These are very varied. These I'm going to just acknowledge, of course, that it was identified we need to prioritize fixing certain, certain impediments in the trade relations. We will acknowledge that and put that away for a later date. We will not talk about that today. But in areas of pharmaceuticals and connectivity in agriculture in education in tourism in so many things there is potential for cooperation between our two countries and specifically in the tech sector which is what we're going to be talking about today i will first go to our panelist arvind gupta to talk about how india has navigated this digital frontier by all accounts we've navigated it pretty successfully the digital public infrastructure is a success story Arvind, could you talk to us about how did that happen? How did the how was the India stack built? What are the use cases that have been successful? What is it that we can look forward to? Thank you, uh, uh, Prerna and uh, everybody else uh, uh, who is uh, behind organizing this from Ananta and from the Aspen New Zealand group. Um, uh, let me just go 10 years back actually to this day. Today is the 15th of February, around the 7th or 8th of February in 2014. Um, 
current prime minister was not in uh, purpose. Uh, we need to use uh, digital as a means for empowerment um, of uh, everybody in India, very inclusive digital movement in India, where um, digital will, will be the empowering tool. Uh, so the very first thing when he came into power post May to 2014 was to look at what technologies uh, exist and uh, um, and I'm just giving a little background so that you understand where how we reached where we are today and um, why did we not use the standardized approach of the US uh, the Western models and the Chinese models and I'll come to all of that and how it paid off um, in, in the geopolitical world of technology that we are living in today so um, Basically, we came up with a digital India uh, vision and a plan in 2014, which highlight, which said that we need to see, we need to take a very brand new, different approach to um, to building a digitally empowered society, which is not a top down approach, which was which was a standard procedure that you know you provide um, means and tools to people who are connected. But here, the, the biggest challenge was how do you ensure that everybody can benefit from digital empowerment bottom up. And our challenges were that we only had out of a population of about 1.2 billion and about a billion adults. We only had about 14% connected citizens in 2014. And how do you give uh, connectivity to the poorest of poor? Uh, and that was that was challenge number one. Two, how do you ensure that um, the digital tooling that we do is, as I said, bottom up? That means uh, everybody at the bottom of the pyramid also can benefit uh, from it somewhere or the other. And three, how can India control its own destiny by, while doing that? And that is where the geopolitical angle comes in. And so instead of just relying on the models that existed, the three, uh, the two big, uh, two big models that existed in the world was the Silicon Valley models, which is you know top down, use the big platforms, the big tech as they're called to. To uh, to you know give access and uh, and provide digital services to the citizens or the Shenzhen Valley model which was uh, a slightly different model had a lot of uh, high tech and everything else built into it but had con we had concerns around surveillance and other things on it from from the initial days um, and so India said that um, can we now start looking at providing for example a digital identity to every citizen of India. We're already doing something called the Aadhaar project, which is the national digital identification project. So how can we make it as a tool where the first use case will be the government? And when you get uh, the government as a first use case, and why was government the first use case? Because we were finding that out of the a billion adults in India, um, 300 million had not one, but multiple forms of identification. So there was no clearly, you know, there was no clear way of saying that, you know, who, who is Arvind Gupta, for example. I could have multiple forms of identification. And the rest 700 million either had no identification or did not even know existed in any system. So the big challenge was to provide a unique identity to everybody and to use that unique identity to then seed into the government systems, which will, uh, which will then enable the government to ensure that there are no duplicacies, leakages, or fakes, or dead people claiming benefits. The the other big challenge, societal challenge, was that um, you know it was the World Bank report that of the hundred, let's say, billion dollars that was given out in benefits in India, only fifteen billion would reach the intended recipients. Eighty-five billion would be lost in leakages. So, uh, so the government said, hey, if we can be the first user, in, you know, um, uh, before anybody else. We have a we can create a system which where we we are you know raising our hands and you know we'll be the first user. So suddenly we had use cases, and the use case was to give these benefits directly into the bank accounts. And um, here is where we realized that the bank accounts need to be you know given out to everybody. So we had uh, Prena. I'm going to just summarize very very quickly. We set up Thank what is now today called India Stack, which is nothing but a, a very easy to understand from a from an outside perspective it's a layer of technology which was initially rolled out with two things number one uh, identity a digital identity to, to every citizen of india currently it has 1.3 billions enrolled into it and two uh, a system to do what is called ekyc and anybody in the fintech industry would understand the ekyc was a second what is called a paperless enrollment tool which enabled 
uh, the government to to start with the first piece of this benefits, which was to give a bank account, a holder of money to every citizen of India. And this is the the, the biggest um, bank financial inclusion that ever happened. 58% of Indians didn't have an access to bank account. Today, um, every single Indian at, at a family level has access to bank account. More than 800 million Indians have bank accounts. Um, and from, you know, as I said, from from almost fifty percent at family level to hundred percent at the household level, there there are bank accounts everywhere. Now, what that did is, um, along with the bank accounts, along with the phone numbers, and and with the with the identity number, the government started implementing the first use case, which was a direct benefits transfer, where three hundred and twenty schemes of the government are now pushing money using this infrastructure to to give out benefits and that removes the leakages the you know the fakes and the um, and the um, and the duplicates and the and the dead folks and it's very interesting to note that more than 100 billion a million 100 million duplicates and fakes were removed from the system who were actually wrongly in, uh, availing a benefit and that itself has resulted in so much of ben uh, so much of savings to the government now why this is important is that while we were building this and it, the first user was the government, the government realized that they are sitting on a tool which need, not only the government can use, but if you make it open for other people to use. Now, who are the other sections of the ecosystem that could use it? So as I said, government already was using it. We could now open this up for startups to use the EKYC phenomena or startups to enroll like for, for trading platforms, for banks, for fintechs, to start enrolling the customers using this EKYC tool, so you you are removing the paper and uh, paper based processes, and um, and thirdly, you could allow big businesses to use it. So basically, every section of the society started using this this whole stack of presence less and paperless, the identity and the paperless stack, stack of EKYC, and suddenly it became a stack. And and how we added to the stack was. We added the payments layer, which is the third layer to the stack, and the, the data layer, which is the fourth layer to the stack. And I'm cognizant of my time, so I will quickly end here. Suddenly, this became, from just being a tool for, for the government usage, became a full stack. And that is where we, we you know, kind of made it into a digital public infrastructure. By definition, it is it is a digital public infrastructure because it is not controlled by either the government or just one company. It is a very different model than the U.S. or the Chinese model. It's open to public, means uh, entities which are either the government entities or uh, startups or businesses or societal players can all participate from um, in in this uh, using this technology to to make their products better, make innovation happen on top of it. They don't have to worry about the fundamentals. And especially with the UPI that Prena has mentioned, and I can go on and on and explain about UPI, but um, the, this is how the build out of the DPIs, the digital public infrastructure, as it happened in India, and that's the genesis of it. And of course, it paid a lot of dividends when we saw uh, technology becoming a geopolitical tool. And, um, and when we banned Chinese platforms in, in, in June 2020, it did not impact anything in India at all, um, because we were not dependent on one technology per se. India has rolled out 5G telecom network without a single Chinese uh, component in, in, the, in, in its network, and still the fastest rollout of 5G in the world. So, so that's how I think um, India has managed to navigate the digital frontier. It's a story because it's a participation of public and private um, players, which but enables uh, everybody to benefit from it. And the last point I do want to mention is that because of the success of the first DPI, which was around GovTech and FinTech and insurance tech, now we have smelled the blood, if you can call it. We are now building DPIs in health. Um, the travel stack thing is now being taken many many lessons and learnings from it. I'll just uh, thank you, Freena, for letting me open with this. 
Arvind, uh, my apologies, but I'm going to request you to perhaps try switching your video off because there was a lag in the last minute or so of what you were saying. And uh, if you could just repeat for the audience the last few things that you said, I think we lost you somewhere around. After smelling the blood, we're also looking at building a health stack, but from there. So, yeah, so we, uh, you know, the government has realized the immense potential. And in fact, the finance minister in, in her budget, this uh, interim budget this time said that digital public infrastructure is the new factor of production, which means that it is giving not only savings on one side, but it's causing ecosystem value. Uh, creation happening, which is enabling, you know, uh, almost um, half a trillion dollars worth of valuation and, and uh, digital economy to be created. So the digital public infrastructure is now being created for health, for skilling, for travel, for uh, a voice stack, uh, commerce stack, ONDC, and it's going on and on. The large thing in this is that while we are building and solving some tough to some vital problems, we're also controlling the data exhaust. And that's where what I had mentioned uh, in, at the end that the data exhaust, which is going to, which is a game changer for the by technology as well as policy. All right. Thank you so much, Arvind. I'm just going to highlight again because there was lag right towards the 10 seconds, but thank you so much for reiterating that point. Amit, I'm going to go from that to you. Arvind, right as he was starting his context setting, he mentioned that the digital will be the empowering tool. That was the motto based on which the digital public infrastructure in India was built. What is it that we need to empower more than agriculture? And since that's an area that you are particularly passionate about, let's ask you, what are the problems in agriculture that you think can be solved using tech? In ag in building agri-tech, are there any areas of cooperation between India and New Zealand? Are there, what is it that we can look forward to? What's the last mile? What's the building case? Tell us everything. Great. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Christine and Prerna for, for having me on this and very, very pleased to be on this uh, session with leaders who actually are shaping uh, whatever they're driving in their uh, in their ecosystems. Um, you know, I, I, I will start with, uh, I'll set some context and I will start with the fact that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased that we're having this discussion. I'm an Indian Kiwi who lives in Singapore. So uh, Arvind, I just wanted to say, I, I'm currently in Gurgaon and my internet seems to be working really well. I think you're in Singapore at the moment and there seems to be some challenges. Um, probably a question mark around where the fastest internet is today. Um, but I will and say- And the cheapest. <laughs> and the cheapest, <laughs> Amit. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And and look, there are many of these things that we know Arvind has had a role to play. Um, I will say one thing. I think the India stack is a absolute remarkable story of inclusive innovation. Right. I mean, a lot of nations, enterprises build to drive, try to drive innovation, but it's one thing to get, you know, a billion plus people on it and, and include it and be part of that uh, journey. So I think there is a lot of learning there from India. And there's some the, the reason I'm sharing this is there's some it, it, it's there's some context to what I want to talk about from from an agri tech standpoint. But if you're OK, Prerna, I just want to give kind of just a little bit of a uh, little bit more context. Right. So. You know, since we're talking about collaboration between India and New Zealand, it's always very important. Partnerships are built when you work around the strengths of each other and bridge the gaps, right? So if I look at New Zealand, New Zealand is a very, very digital native nation. Um, I will tell you, I the only form, and, you know, maybe Carmen can comment on it when, when, when she speaks, but the only form that I actually fill in New Zealand is my passport form. And actually, even that, most of that gets pre-populated. And I just have to update current information, right? Um, everything else um, doesn't actually require filling a form. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but literally there's no forms. So, and that's been, and, and bear in mind, I moved to Singapore from New Zealand in 2009. So my experience of that is 2009. So go back to 2009, 2008, 2009, I wasn't filling forms. So I think there is something about the digital economy in New Zealand. New Zealand recently um, about, back in the middle of COVID in 2020, launched the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement along with Chile and, and, and Singapore. 
called it's called Deepa, and it's really about building more digital trade, digital uh, econ, you know, digital connectivity between nations, people, commerce, um, and governments, right? And, and it tackles all the issues we are talking about, like data privacy, AI, and it's about and and I think there is there's a lot of there's a lot there that New Zealand can bring in terms of R and D and innovation um, that perhaps New Zealand doesn't have the wherewithal to scale. And I'll and, and I'll address that. And I think that's um, you know we look at innovation. I mean, New Zealand always demonstrated it. It's a function of it's a simple statement we've learned since we were in school. Necessity is the mother of uh, of invention, right? And the tyranny of distance for New Zealand. Now it's all digital, right? But go back a hundred years when the UK was the primary market and they had to ship products there, meat, dairy, all of that. How do you get it there without it spoiling? So that's how refrigerated shipping came about, right? So right from there on, it's been very practical innovation to solve for problems that really exist. So I think there is a great marrying of um, opportunities. If you can combine the innovation and R&D and the scale and capacity that India can bring is a massive opportunity to solve for um, a bunch of problems. And I think that's where I come to Agritech. And, um, but just before that, just because Arvind talked about the health stack, I do think there is a massive opportunity for New Zealand and India to work on healthcare because New Zealand does have a very inclusive healthcare system, even though it's a smaller market, it does not differentiate public private health um, and patient care is actually very unified and very ubiquitous, right? So as a, as a patient, I actually have, I can walk to any clinic, any doctor, any hospital, doesn't matter and I'll be able to um, pick up the conversation with the with the GP or a specialist. But coming to agritech, I think the opportunity really uh, in agritech is if you think about New Zealand, um, you know we have 5.5 million people, definitely the largest dairy contributor in uh, largest contributor of global dairy trade. Um, there's obviously a very large uh, amount of um, contribution into the economy from you know produce like fruit, apple, pear. Uh, kiwi fruit, um, and then of course the um, the opportunity with um, livestock, right? So and and looking at how to tackle livestock, the issues caused by livestock, right? So my sense is, if there was if there was an opportunity ever for two nations to work together, it is to work towards a larger goal that goes beyond their own issues and problems, and you know to me that's about solving world hunger. If New Zealand and India can work together, bringing New Zealand's capability, I mean, it is a disproportionate GDP per capita for in the agrarian economy. Um, so obviously, a lot of that is, is a function of technology and innovation in different areas. Now, if you imagine you bring that ability to drive greater yield, bring India's digital prowess and, and the scale and the ability to roll this out at scale, start with solving this for India. You know, the biggest challenge in India is supply chain because, you know, there's so many different climates and, and uh, you know, it's a very diverse landscape. Transporting produce, fresh produce, um, is one of the biggest challenges. But if you can solve for that supply chain, and by the way, India is a leader now in solving for supply chain. There's something to be said about, you know, ordering fresh food in, uh, you know, on Zomato and, being, and, and getting it delivered anywhere in India. Solving that for 1.4 billion people, there's something there, right? So if you can combine that ability to drive better yield, supply, solve for the supply chain, and then uh, you know help the farmers industrialize food processing, so they're not just sitting at the bottom of the value chain, they're able to go up the value chain, you're actually able to make a huge dent in terms of um, reshaping the whole agrarian economy in India. And then the opportunity is how do you then bring these two capabilities together and and build it out in uh, in countries where it's really needed in Africa and, and and you know some of the other markets. So I mean that's that's kind of my um, broad take on the on the on the agri tech piece. Excellent. Very helpful. Thank you so much. I'm just going to go out of uh, original order just for a second because Arvind put up something in the chat where he mentioned ONDC is doing just that, which I assume he was talking about the value chain integration. Arvind, could you just mention that and talk to us about that for a minute? Yeah, um, you know, while what Amit says is uh, there are a lot of angles to it. One of the things is how, does, how do farmers get better um, 
returns and uh, faster connectivity directly into the um, uh, into the market directly. So the the e-commerce stack, which is called ONDC in India, Open Network for Digital Commerce, is partnering with the farmer producers organizations, the FPOs, to just do that. So I just wanted to comment on that. And again, yeah. another benefit of having a digital public infrastructure, which is non-rent seeking and right. is available to everybody. Yeah. Um, farmers lose about 30% or 40% in market um, intermediation. When people are, there are people uh, intermediating in the market, but they shouldn't be with no value add. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a great point. If I may just add, I think that's my whole point. India already has this digital public infrastructure. You can build on it. And one is solving for the commerce element for the farmers. But the other issue I actually think is being able to produce more and having it shipped more efficiently to uh, to where it's needed on our tables, right? And I think that's the piece that if you combine the, the capabilities and the technology innovation that New Zealand brings with what India can achieve from a digital standpoint, I think the opportunity is immense. This is a fascinating conversation. We will definitely get back to this. But right now, let's go to Carmen and talk about another piece of the puzzle, which Arvind mentioned in passing as one of the layers that was built upon the India stack, which was the payments layer. Now, in India, that came about in, in the form of unified payments interface, which is what we call UPI. But what our Indian audience members might not be aware of is Auckland's fastest growing tech subsector is fintech. New Zealand is actually ranks in top 20 worldwide in terms of the fastest growing fintech uh, fintech sectors of the world. So Carmen, can we talk about that? Can we talk about what innovation is, What what's the innovation in the fintech sector in New Zealand? What is it that India can learn from New Zealand? What is it that New Zealand can learn from India? Of course, there is the scaling element that um, it's already referred to, but what exactly do we mean by it? Is there any problem that needs to be solved that we can collaborate on? Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, what an amazing topic and absolutely love the work Amit's doing um, and in awe of the work um, that uh, Amit uh, Gupta Avan did actually with the digital India digital stack, which is just absolutely game changing. Um, so we all know collaboration accelerates innovation. And New Zealand, um, you know, is really, really leading the world in fintech. And one of the reasons I believe is, you know, we have um four big banks uh, and lots of littler banks and number five banks getting quite big, but they're incredibly collaborative. And when we set out um, as a fintech um, to do something that um, requires really strong regulatory compliance, you know, it really required uh, the best technology um, and really the adoption of innovators to say, well, actually, this is a better experience for our customers. So we're going to change the way that we've always done it. And I think a lot of digital um, transformation is not just about technology, it's around cultural um, thinking and adoption. And I'm going to talk around why we love working in India and why would I believe, you know, New Zealand is so successful at this. And so, um, you know, and I'll share a little bit of our story as an NZ tech company that's actually working in India and often it's the other way around. Um, and so every bank in the world has to validate the value of a property before they can lend money on it. And Velocity helps them do that better and faster in New Zealand and Australia. And it's very much regulated that a customer can't just go to a valuer and that it needs to come through digitally. And so, um, you know, we really managed to get incredible adoption in New Zealand where the banks are very focused on the two things, regulatory compliance, um, which is very rigid in Australia and New Zealand, but also um, faster, more seamless customer experiences. And that's only possible with data and digital. And we really heard um, Arvind talk to the benefits of a digital stack. And when you have digital connectivity, you can actually transform experiences and go faster and scale. And as Amit said, every New Zealand company knows there's only for us, there's only um, so many 1.2 million properties in New Zealand, a very small population, we built to scale. And after getting 90% of the New Zealand market using our platform, we went from New Zealand, we expanded into agri, into insure tech, into real estate, into consumers. But then we went to Australia, as most Kiwi tech companies do, and started working with Commonwealth Bank of Australia, ING, and really innovative lenders. But from there, when we looked at where to go next, most 
fintechs then go to America, the UK, and certainly there's opportunity there as well as China. New Zealand has a long history partnering with China. But there is no better place to partner and collaborate and really cross-pollinate the best of digital tech and particularly fintech than in India. And for India, it was very much the perfect storm. You have tremendous urbanization, you have the fastest growing economy in the world, and then you have a government driving financial inclusion, housing for all, affordability, and all of these phenomenal um, game-changing things that impact the population that really can deliver impact and can be really transformational at scale. And so it's a um, completely different market going from a very mature market and certainly in FinTech in Australia and New Zealand, particularly in the housing lending space, we are um, certainly one of the most mature markets in the world, I would say. We have very robust data we know everything about a property and we can build automated valuation models that run across portfolios. We can lay a climate risk. We can actually measure finance emissions at a property level and we can really do so much with the rich data. And then we switch it over to India. It's really such um, a dichotomy because um, there is no data. And when we first went to India, Everybody asked us, well, what about the data? And if you've been to India, you will know it has some incredibly advanced data. It's pretty staggering that so many 1.3 billion people have an Aadhaar card, but there isn't any addressing. And for a bank to validate the value of a property, they need to be able to benchmark and know what else is there. And so it was this tremendous challenge for us to solve. Um, in the market, the size of Europe, um, and as complex as Europe, um, you know, and so um, what was very exciting was the impact that we could make through digital adoption, through leveraging what was proven in the New Zealand market um, with significant product market fit. Although any company looking at working in India has to recognize it's an incredibly unique market. And what we understood was we actually had to localize and change what we did. And for digital adoption and the use of technology, you have to create fair value exchange. And so what we did in India is created an app for all the valuers so that when they go to the property, they can download the, um, the, the address, but also we preloaded the bank's valuation forms for all of the banks we were working with. So the valuer suddenly has a digital tool in his hands, geotags the address, captures all the property attributes, um, takes the photos, timestamps, and sends that back to the, the bank. Talking and or earlier, um, we heard Arvind talk to a poem, paperless to digital. And certainly it was tremendously transformation going from paperless where um, projects and paper had to be picked up in the branches um, to now actually delivering this in the hand of a valuer at the property. And the tremendous exciting thing about working in India is that India is leapfrogging the world with their desire to digitize and adopt new technology. So we thought we were wonderful. And the bank said, well, you reduced the turnaround time from four weeks to four hours. And that's all lovely. But what about the legal? And we were like, what about the legal? Uh, and they wanted to share it with legal. So we had to create legal IQ, which we didn't do in any other market. In India, 50% of properties and loans is new build projects. And as part of government initiatives um, and housing for all, it's a significant growth sector that they're seeing. And again, we had to build Build IQ, another new module for India specifically because they wanted to digitize this process. And so what we're really seeing is actually, even though we started in New Zealand and we've been here for nine or so years and we work with some of the largest lenders in Australia as well, our innovation um, momentum and roadmap and all the new deliveries have really shifted and gone from our mature market in New Zealand to our manual market in India to now leapfrog and drive this innovation um, and really push us to say, well, actually, what about all these other things that you can digitize? And it's absolutely game changing that suddenly we can now create indices for tier two cities, tier three cities. And actually, we can actually aggregate address data um, and uh, government banking uh, developers can now make driven decisions. And that's what digital very much enables. 
Um, I think for any innovation, it does require collaboration. And that is where we see that in New Zealand, in the willingness for all of the CEOs of a bank to get in the room um, and partner and share information and, and innovate. And we really see that, um, is, you know, in India at another level. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal to be meeting. I meet the CEOs of some of the largest banks in the world and they know all about their customer experience and the home loan journey and details around the pain points of valuations that we're solving that are just incredible that the level of detail that they're across and their understanding of digital and technology and their desire to innovate and adopt and create and move to new is really, really, uh, I think, unparalleled. And I think that's really across the ecosystem and we've been lucky to work with um, innovators like Amitabh Kant, um, to have NZ Tech, uh, TE um, and Mr. David Pine and the commissioner and all of that support really helps give credibility as well, which is also really, really important for cross collaboration um, and cross partnership. And um, so certainly, you know, we really see that cultural alignment. Um, if you are thinking of working on India, though, you cannot go and date in India and think you're suddenly going to get married. You have to go back. You can't just actually do one visit and think you're going to do the deal. Um, it's very much about values and partnership and alignment and showing value. And I think that's probably for all the New Zealand companies on the line thinking of India, we would not be anywhere else in the world. Um, but it's a commitment. You can't just go and visit once, whether you're whoever you are. Um, you have to go and understand the market, be in the market and build the relationships and, um, and make the journey. And fortunately, we have a Kiwi actually leading one of the largest airlines in India um, and hopefully bringing that journey to be a shorter journey. Um, so I'll wrap up there, but certainly there's so many similarities. Um, our love for cricket, as you say, our love for food um, and um, our love for delivering um, impact. And that's what's exciting um, that, if, you know, property and a home is for is still the most valuable asset in the world and for most people, their most valuable asset. And the focus on that in the New Zealand market and the focus on that in the Indian market also brings us together that everyone understands the importance of home ownership and um, economic stability and market transparency, which are all things driving growth. Thank you. I do have follow-ups, but I'd like to go to Indrani first. I will address a few things there again. Indrani, let's uh, talk about something Carmen just mentioned, which is delivering impact. And India seems to be deliver delivering impact, not just domestically, but globally. So how has the digital public infrastructure broadened India's foreign policy options? Over to you. You're on mute. Uh, thank you, Preda. And... Uh... Uh, thank you, Christine, for doing this and welcome everybody. Well, um, you know, Arvind gave you a, 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 just a tiny peek into what the digital public infrastructure uh, process in India is. I mean, he can talk for hours because he is actually the, the real expert on this. As part of foreign policy, I mean, India has has taken the digital public infrastructure global in a way that um, I, I, I found somebody saying that the digital public infrastructure piece is India's software driven version of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which uh, it may or may not be, but what it has done is um, taken the Indian experience uh, global in a way that no roads, bridges, uh, or uh, government buildings that have been built by us could have done. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give you a, a personal uh, uh, anecdote. Uh, last year, uh, the, the, digital the digital transformation minister of Japan Taro Kono was in India and uh, I, he caught me and said, how do I make an, a UPI payment? So I had to take him to get him a cup of coffee and uh, do a UPI payment. So he was, um, uh, he was flawed and he came back a few months later to say that <clears throat> he's been trying to push it within the Japanese system. And uh, the 
the big dis the difficulty is coming in from the central bank of Japan, not really from the users. Um, but it get it tells you the uh, how the universe literally opens up, uh, and India has not shied away from using the DPI uh, as part of its foreign policy tool. Um, as you know, India, India's DPI usage, or rather the United Payments Interface interface usage, uh, surpasses the top four westernized economies. Um, it is uh, seventeen percent higher than the U.S. and four percent higher than China, which uh, was the largest uh, so far. Uh, the first. Uh, international foray of the of DPI as foreign policy was with Singapore uh, with the pay now uh, with the pay now system uh, with the UAE the Mashrek Bank's uh, new pay system we have now taken it to France um, it was a big uh, part of India's G20 presidency uh, of 2023 uh, during the G20 presidency, among all the stacks that India uh, pushed, the DPI uh, was A, the biggest, but it was also the one which had the greatest traction, uh, particularly in the global south. Um, I don't know how much of, how far you know this, but uh, India create, had created something called the Global Digital Public uh, Infrastructure Repository, which is um, a way to put the technology together uh, to help countries access the technology uh, and to be able to give them funding, to give them access to funding so that countries can use the DPI stack but tailor it to their own use, tailor it to themselves. And that is the beauty of the India stack because it can be customized. It's not a one size fits all because everybody's needs are different. And um, if you look at Nepal and Bhutan, they come with a completely different set of um, needs in the public infrastructure, as opposed to say Singapore and UAE, which are much more uh, advanced uh, markets. Um, in the developed world, in the West, India started um, a collaboration with France uh, and India and France would now be uh, building the interoperable systems to be able to take the DPI to Europe. In fact, uh, this was actually the biggest piece of the EU-India Trade and Technology Council. Uh, for those that don't know this, the EU has a TTC or the Trade and Technology Council with only two countries in the world. Um, they started with the US, but India was the second. And the digital corridor that is sought to be built uh, will be a huge um, leapfrogging of uh, digital interoperability, digital compatibility between India and Europe. Uh, this is important for a number of reasons uh, because a, the, as we all spoke about it, Carmen, Arvind, Amit all spoke about the leapfrogging nature of India's DPI stack. It takes, it make, it helps countries like in, the, in Europe, certainly countries like Germany, who with all their prowess have been very, very slow to adopt um, digital payment system, digital infrastructure. In fact, I, I think until a couple of months ago, it it took um, a 24 hour turnaround for a, an online transaction to be completed in Germany, which is which for all of us here in India is unimaginable uh, anymore. Um, the uh, the other part that India is working on is with particularly with France because with France we have a very large uh, sort of um, intersection of values of systems of intent and we we'll be uh, India is working on the, on taking DPI 
two countries in uh, Africa and in the Indo-Pacific, um, certainly in the in South Pacific, where uh, both Australia and New Zealand can be very good partners. Uh, so Australia has already come into this as part of the Quad um, uh, piece because Quad arrangement has a big part of uh, DPI, which leads from the fact that the US and India um, started off on their biggest uh, global uh, digital public infrastructure partnership that was uh, signed when Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited uh, Washington in June of 2023. Um, the G20 summit uh, saw the creation of two uh, big um, structures. That was the global, uh, that was called the One Future Alliance and uh, the Global Digital Public Infrastructure Repository, um, which will both of which intended to take the Indian experience to the rest of the world. Um, on the sidelines of the G20 Summit too, uh, India signed up with nine African countries uh, for access to DPI uh, and for, for its implementation completely free of cost. But again, uh, these are all customizable um, all for uh, all to suit and to tailor the needs of the countries that want to implement this. Now, why again, why is this uh, important both for India and for countries in the global south? Um, first, direct benefits transfer, which is uh, the kind of welfare programs that India has put in place. Um, as Arvind talked about, uh, reducing leakage in the system, um, much more important. And these are very important for other global South countries as well. Um, to implement something called fiscal discipline. Um, Arvind spoke about uh, 100 billion, uh, of 100 billion uh, benefits, only 15 billion benefits made it to the end user. Fiscal discipline uh, is maintained much more transparently through this infrastructure. A very big piece, which we try not to talk about, but it exists in very large quantities, is corruption. Uh, building transparency in the, in the digital public infrastructure space uh, eliminates corruption. Carmen, you spoke about property um, and uh, home ownership being a big part of it. One of the, uh, one of the I think, intended consequences of building the digital public infrastructure stack in India has been to um, reduce corruption, particularly in the real estate space. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a topic that requires a, a seminar all by itself. Um, but this is something that brings in transparency in public uh, dealings, which a builds trust in uh, governance but it also builds better governance structures. And last but not the least, it is uh, it has served as an accelerator for the sustainable development goals. Um, it, uh, all of us are struggling to meet our SDGs. Uh, this is one of the one of the best acceler uh, one of the best ways of leapfrogging uh, to meeting your SDG goals. Um, the last point that I wanted to talk about is, and this is something we hear a lot from, say, Europe, uh, European countries, but from many other, particularly advanced economies, on the protection of data. How do you, how do we protect data? How do we, um, how is it that uh, the digital infra infrastructure can protect data of over a billion citizens? And we have now, as Arvind said, we've got very ambitious. We've moved uh, to um, not just the health stack, but if you walk into any you're in any airport in India today, at least it's rolling out in the major airports. If you walk into the into an airport, there are face recognition that takes you through uh, the airport security, etc., in a way that we couldn't even imagine, uh, and we don't get in many Western countries, but there is a concern, and that concern has been articulated, certainly. So one of the things that the Indian system has actually created is called the DEPA, also known as the Data Empowerment and uh, Protection Architecture. One of the things that this is, is working on 
a, uh, and we will see a rollout of this, is what is called the confidential clean rules, which where which you can access sensitive data, but in an algorithm, uh, uh, with algorithms that control access, with algorithms that control protection. Now that is very important as uh, with consent, with consent as Arvind very correctly points out. Um, that is very important as we turn the digital public infrastructure into a much more sophisticated uh, piece of architecture that we would like to roll out for India and for the world. And I will stop here. Thank you, Preza. You have given us a lot of meat to go off on, Indrani. So we have about 15 minutes to fold in audience questions as well as do a follow-up conversation amongst each other. There is one audience question which is very similar to the points Indrani raised, where a uh, a viewer is asking what should be an approach to reach every beneficiary and how can transparency be maintained. Now, as I heard from Arvind's remarks earlier in the conversation, there were three large problems or or like, let's not call them problems, three vectors that we were basing the public infrastructure development on. It was access, efficiency and consumer experience. Now, talking, taking all of that into account and talking about the Global South problems, which seem to have a lot in common with India's problems. Arvind, can we ask you to respond to all of these things? Can we see what are the what are the next steps? And I'm going to make a slight pushback question here, which is when we talk about India's ability to scale and the success we've already had, with scaling come a few problems, like the pushback we've received from credit card companies where the merchants seem to have a smaller piece of the pie and it's not sitting well with them. How is that conversation going? What can we expect out of that conversation? Uh, uh, Prerna, thank you. And uh, Aditya's question, let me... Um, Technology-based governance, our Prime Minister spoke about it yesterday at the World Government Summit, is totally non-discriminatory. It's a it's a name, number, um, uh, based criteria. Uh, and number is your uh, identity number, which is Aadhaar, and your name. Um, mm -hmm. And you meet certain eligibility criteria. So, for example, if you are a a girl student studying in uh, uh, in school, 11th and 12th grades, um, uh, or high school, basically, you have eligibility to receive certain uh, nutrition, scholarships, and um, a, a books benefit. That's a benefit. It's a social welfare program. Um, you, As long as you enroll in it, um, the system sees your eligibility and then just uh, checks that you are not a duplicate, you're not availing for it anywhere else. And if not, you you just basically start getting the benefit in, into the bank account of the mother's account, because if you're under 18, you don't have a bank account. Over 18, you get it directly. If you're a college student, you get it directly into your bank account. So um, the question of discrimination in a technology-based governance system actually does not arise because technology does not discriminate. It's it's uh, at the end of the, uh, the day, and I have to point it out, the Aadhaar database, the National Identity Database, is basically, it has some demographic information, no caste, no religion, nothing else. So it has an address, it has a name, it has your date of birth, and it has a gender. Uh, so far, it's a, a male and female and, you know, not disclosed gender. So that's the end of story. There is nothing else. Um, now, which caste, which religion, which uh, where you know where I belong to, we do have a discrimination uh, where it uh, when it comes to, and I'm just saying this in the lighter side, that if you are paying income tax on a million dollars and you are claiming a benefit for uh, for cooking as subsidy, we will make you ineligible and we'll throw you out of the system, and that is what is not allowed. Um, that we discriminate on that, and that's uh, that's eligibility criteria. So, um, but uh, the technology by itself does not discriminate on anything else. Uh, second point uh, on the on the headwinds you talked about. Well, any leapfrogging, any disruption disrupts somebody's business model. Uber disrupted uh, the traditional taxi business model, which eventually they they all came around and 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 started using the uh, same Ubers and the bolts of the world to their advantage. But initially there was a pushback. In India, the credit card companies had a major pushback to a system which is non-rent seeking. So today, as Indrani mentioned in G20, uh, you know, if I uh, if I wanted to make a, a ten cent payment, it was unimaginable to to be made uh, in a in a in a formal way. I had to use cash. 
And, um, and the lessons are amazing because uh, I had to use cash. I had to then, you know, there was an economy which was instead of giving me change. So suppose and just for the international audience, if I bought something for 28 rupees, which is about 40 cents or 35 cents, um, that I would generally end up paying like a 50 rupee note. I would get a 20 rupee note back and two rupees worth of candy. Now this candy company has gone out of business because in this site, in this segment, because this two, two rupees, I don't get back in candy any longer. I just pay 28 rupees directly from my, from my, from my, from my UPI payment system. So, uh, so there is a, I mean, I'm not saying they did a pushback. I'm just giving an example. There are, there is a lot of, um, uh, people in the system who were disrupted and credit card companies, including um, credit card companies survived on the rent seeking, the 2%, the 1%, the debit cards even had rent. Now it's all gone both because of the techno regulatory nature of UPI, which is both a technology tool, but also a regulatory tool to, to make it a non rent seeking uh, 0% uh, of this um, uh, transaction charges below a certain amount of payment. The model I must say, globally, and this is something I and Rani highlighted it, I'm going to pinpoint again. It's co-creation when we talk to other countries. Two, we give technology. It's not that the technology is hosted in India and you are using it. Um, and that's a big difference. And and um, and the last thing I want to say is that it, it is a model where you have control over your data and there is a whole data empowerment tool, the consent architecture, and that, that is then used for giving out better credit, better formalization and many other things. So when countries understand this um, and the ecosystems understand it, they they themselves figure out a way to clear those headwinds away, which are coming from this from the local established players um, as we go along. India did it. Uh, India not only shares, as Indrani mentioned very eloquently, not only shares technology, but also talent and best practices and the policies that we came about to implement this at a population scale of a billion people. That's very helpful. Thank you. And speaking of population scales, just uh, to highlight the population differential here, India at about just under 700 million internet users still only has an internet penetration of about 49%. But New Zealand at 91% internet penetration has 4.3 or 4. I think 4.2 million internet users. So while it looks really skewed, doesn't it? 91% internet penetration, but for India, a tiny number of 4.1 million users. But why I mention this, why I talk about this particular vector coming to Amit and Carmen is with the internet penetration as high as 91%, I think data protection, data security, as Indrani mentioned, would be a concern for uh, consumers in New Zealand, particularly. Well, how are we addressing this? And going off of that and taking Arvind's comments into account, is a potential area of collaboration between India and New Zealand in the larger digital frontier space, perhaps establishing global standards? If so, where can we see this happening? May I just, yes. Carmen, thank you. So I, I think, um, you know, it's it's very interesting. It's a It's very important to put context behind numbers sometimes, right? I mean, people might, because when I, if I mention this to someone that New Zealand has that, internet penetration and the numbers and people go, but that's only 5.5 million people you have to tackle. India has 1.4 billion people. But let me flip that. New Zealand is a very geographically dispersed country, which means, so the government, so here's what inclusivity really is, right? The government has a commitment to make sure that every Kiwi has access to internet, has access to all the basic amenities, internet, healthcare, financial services, and this is, you know, I'm talking about, this is the this is the fabric of the nation, right? Um, and this has been in, it doesn't matter if you're on a farm that's 200 kilometers from nowhere, you will have access to that. And the government holds telecom New Zealand. In fact, I was part of um, the project for the structural separation of telecom New Zealand into their, you know, separating the wholesale and retail business in 2007. And the whole, Genesis of that was the government was very clear that Telecom New Zealand needs to service the infrastructure for telco across the nation. Doesn't matter where it is, where someone lives, they've got to have that basic infrastructure and hence decentralizing the retail part of that business, right? So, so just sharing some context there. If I may, I, I just have a few views and I love listening to 
um, you know, Indrani and, and Urban Share have, you know, obviously followed that very closely. I'm a beneficiary of that myself in, in India. Um, but I will say one thing, you know, I'm I'm just a simple entrepreneur, right? I, in my, um, outside of my business, I, uh, I'm i the global chair for, for TIE, TIE, which is the world's largest entrepreneur uh, network. And it's a give back platform. And to me, entrepreneurship is good for the world because it solves for, um, it uses, it drives innovation that solves for some of our biggest challenges. I think there are two or three points I want to make. And, you know, one is, you know, size doesn't always matter. Like, I think for India to better leverage what it's built, I think it's an opportunity to move beyond looking at the big nations because that gets the most visibility. You know, we talk, work with France and we work with these nine countries in Africa to look at where are the actual pockets of best practice existing today. Is it in Denmark? Is it in New Zealand? Because some of these nations are small, but they actually do have a voice and 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 a power. And I think equally, because the you know, because the opportunity is in business to business ties, which eventually is about people. I think the opportunity is about educating both sides of the stakeholders about the power strengths of each of the nations, right? Because I don't think India's strengths are well known in New Zealand. I'm sure Carmen faces that. Um, and similarly, I don't think anyone knows in India about the strengths that New Zealand brings, apart from, you know, it's a good cricket team that lost the 2019 World Cup final, loses the finals, basically, right? Um, but I do think that can come through if we focus on the cultural aspects of the nation. And sorry if I'm going off on a tangent a little bit, but I think it's very important. I mean, this you know session is about India New Zealand collaboration, so I'm trying to focus on that um, because it's a, it's a topic I'm obviously passionate about. So, you know, when you look at the cultural aspect, one is you know obviously we know all know about the cricket, but there's also there's a bigger piece culturally. Um, you know, if you look at um, just uh, sensitivities of both the cultures. If you look at the Maori culture and culture in India, look at rivers, for example. Rivers are pious in both cultures. Water and resources and sustainability is very important in both cultures in that in that sense. Um, outside of cricket, films is another one, right? I mean, India makes the most movies. New Zealand makes the biggest movies. So Avatar, Lord of the Rings. So I think there is so much there. I would only urge, you know, leaders like Arvin and Indrani, to steer some of the focus away from the geopolitics in this discussion and size the biggest country because you know Australia's got a bigger voice uh, on the global stage, France has a bigger voice. Maybe there's also potential to partner with smaller nations that actually have demonstrated this inclusivity, right? And I will just add, close off on the point that um, you know we talked about corruption. New Zealand has been by far the most consistent in the least corrupt countries in the world. So there's some learnings there that can be taken. And a lot of that is around how you tackle, you know, public infrastructure as well, because it's a part of it, and how you service the public. How do you make it a citizen-centric nation? Um, and data protection, we talked about data protection, should read about the biggest movement in data center investments, one of the biggest markets, a disproportionately large market is New Zealand. You know, ask Amazon, ask Google, ask Microsoft, ask IBM, why they're setting up their data centers there? Because they want to service the global markets because New Zealand has gold standards in data protection. And I'm I'm just highlighting this because it's very important for audiences on both sides to understand. And I think if, if we want to do justice, um, you know, we've talked about the strengths India brings, but I think it's equally important that we look at strengths. The best way to improve is to know that there are lots of areas to learn as well, because I will tell you, uh, and there to be done in the financial services um, space in India, right? I mean, I have, I'm a beneficiary of experiencing financial services in India, Singapore, and New Zealand every day, because these are the, I have three, I hope I have homes in these three countries. And I can tell you, there is still a lot of work to be done there, but it is, there's an opportunity to actually change the world with what India is building. Uh, but I think part of that will also involve learning how to improve some of the things that we might be doing here in India as well. So, yeah, sorry. Um, so I'll add add to um, and build on that, um, that we can see what's possible for India 
from what's already here in New Zealand to build on um, its point. Um, for example, here in our single platform, when a bank transacts on a property, because the government has unlocked disparate data sets um, from different councils, even though we have 75 different councils, we can take those data sets, geotag them and put them in the platform to help a lender or an insurer say yes. And um, if, without that data, they can't do that. So they, and one example is, you know, we, in before if a, um, an area, I won't get too technical, had a, a circle around it or a bubble or a property fit in that circle, the bank, the insurer and the bank might say, no, there's a flood risk. But because we can actually see the construction type of the property, where it sits on the section, it's actually not where the flooding is. The bank and the insurer can say yes. And that's even something very recent where we've gone and combined disparate data sets and made it available. And I think that's so important because there is going to always be a discussion around privacy and around data. And I think there's two different types of data. There's personal data and, of course, Globally, we all have to follow GDPR, the right to be forgotten. There's certainly in most of the countries we work in the need to host clouds locally so data doesn't leave. That should not be a difficult thing for any global company. And certainly how that information is shared. What's really fascinating is uh, in a market like New Zealand where we have such rich data, we know the title ordering, we know who owns the property, who the mortgage encumbrance is, how long it's been, what was the sale date, sale price. We can do phenomenal and robust things without people, without data. And, and we can also look at fraud and transactions and understand trends. In India, when we first started working in the Indian market, it was very interesting because a lot of the questions were around what about the data privacy? Um, which is fascinating because without a platform, what are you doing? You actually are getting the valuer in their Gmail or whatever little platform, they're not using a platform, whatever email thing they're using, it's not bank compliant. It's certainly not secure. I'm sure they didn't do a PCI DSS compliance or ISO compliance or penetration testing like we did. Um, and we're proposing to give the valuer access to that and digitally share that information securely um, instead of just random emails or picking up documents. But so much of the conversation and almost every time we onboard a bank in India, it's quite fascinating that we actually have to go through a massive audit with one of the big four to check what we're doing is compliant. And I think that's a really important, um, we, we understand that's the need to, the right to do business, but it's also fascinating to say, well, what are you doing today before the digital transformation, as opposed to just looking at all the potential risks that could happen with this technology or this data, what about the way you're doing it right now? Um, and so it's a shift of thinking. And I think that's where in New Zealand, we can show how there's certainly a regulation around what you can do with the data and what you can't do with the data. And that is going to continue to evolve around best practice and around brands and around consumer expectations, not just regulation, because most regulators struggle to keep up with the evolving um, certain social and media tools that are out there. And so it's up to organizations to do best practice. Today, a lot of our discussion has been around health, banking, fintech, personal data, and the right to operate is a given that you actually have to have best practice. Um, so there's no point fighting it, um, but actually recognizing that is only possible with technology and data, which is the real exciting part. Can I just add one thing to what Carmen was saying? Just a real life example that I can share myself. You know, um, our home in Auckland, you know, as our kids grew up, we, we, we bought a uh, bought a larger home. It's in Epsom, uh, one of the nicer neighborhoods in Auckland. We bought that house in 2009 online. We never saw the house. We didn't see the house. I saw the house for the first time in, in, in 2010. Um, I think I've seen it maybe thrice because I haven't gone back to live in New Zealand since then. Um, and everything from banking to the mortgage to the inspections and all the government paperwork, whatever was required, I think it probably consumed like an hour of my time and it was all done online. So, and I'm talking about 2009. That's excellent. I can vouch on that and jump on it and say in terms of the cultural and soft power connects that Amit was talking about earlier. I've gone on Airbnb trying to look for places to rent in Auckland. And as a soft power connect thing, 
three out of 10 places I saw had a little Lord Ganesha idol in the band balcony of Airbnbs, which made my heart very happy. Also made me wonder what Indian diaspora is everywhere. But okay, let me just uh, ask Indrani a question that's in the chat, which Arvind seems to have answered, but still bears to be mentioned out loud. Is there scope for trilateral and minilateral cooperation? Uh, can India and New Zealand cooperate with third country? Arvind's answer to that is in innovation and scale, India, New Zealand, but for capital, Singapore. That's Amit's answer. That's oh, sorry, Amit's I'm sorry. Answer, but... yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. My, my eyes are doing that Gupta Gupta thing. Sorry, I didn't realize that that answer went... Yeah, sorry, I didn't I, I didn't know how to do it. Sorry. Yes, that was... But, it's, uh... it's already answered, but I still want to address it to Indrani as our resident foreign policy expert. Uh, Indrani, if you answer that, I will go to Arvind for the last word. So uh, we are certain, I think uh, there is a lot that we can do at the minilateral level. If you look at the Quad, uh, we've already started a Quad partnership on digital public infrastructure. Um, it, uh, the key is the interoperability of the systems, the matching of values, the matching of uh, where we want to be and what our systems look like together. And to Amit's point, and I, uh, uh, that, you know, there are, there, yes, there are the large countries, but you really get more value when you are uh, collaborating with the smaller technologically advanced countries like New Zealand. I, I, I believe that there is a huge appreciation of this point. And I, uh, but a lot of the time, it is the smaller countries, and it's not always New Zealand, but it is the smaller countries that come back to India to say, oh, uh, has your system been accepted by France and, and Germany uh, or the US? It, it is when you, when we have that uh, agreement uh, under, the, under our belt that we get better traction with other countries it's just the way of the world uh it, it's not i mean there's no but we that, which is why uh, as you see we get a we have a better system going ahead with the uae uh rather than with many other countries and i suspect that uh, the partnership with the uae would be much more fruitful than the partnership with say france or germany um as for, uh, and Carmen was uh, talked about GDPR, you know, we do, uh, I think when the Indians are, when Indian systems are working on their regulation, Europe is really the first place we go to uh, when we look at the values that come in with GDPR. The difference uh, is that uh, Indians take a lighter touch um, because in some ways, we believe that the over over uh, emphasis on personal data privacy in the in Europe has actually strangulated their innovation ecosystems. We don't want to go that down that path, and so we take a more uh, open approach to innovation and to uh, creation of uh, but using using data more responsibly, but to be able to keep that door open for innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Stop there. Perfect. We just have one minute, but we will to the audience. We're going to go two minutes uh, over because I would really like Arvind to address the last question in the chat box and make that our concluding point before I hand back over to Christine, which is someone has asked uh, very kindly so that I don't have to rack my brains. What do you envision in the next decade of India's journey in digital public infrastructure? So uh, two very quick com comments. Number one, uh, India's approach it has lessons for um, and it, because the stages of development of every country are different. Indrani very uh, succinctly put that. So India's approach is data empowerment and protection. So how do you use data for your empowerment, but also protect the individuals? And that's why there's it's a more of a consent-based architecture. Um, now, going forward, I think uh, I can't predict for a decade. It's too long. Moore's law is broken. It's it used to be two years cycle. Now it's a year cycle. So ten years is you know it's two to the power of ten. It's uh, it's going to be very very difficult for me to predict. But I can I can say what India or the DPI world is going to do. One is interoperability. Two is setting more global standards. Three looking at societal challenges across the world and seeing how we can you know uh, do it. 
it, it was only the last two years that we have actually now a formal definition what is a DPI. So it's taken a lot of work globally to understand and you know to socialize and uh, this concept across all uh, governments, startups, uh, policymakers, and academicians across the world. So um, I think from here on, what we are going to see is how we can create DPIs at large scale for uh, for not just one one country, but maybe regions like Africa completely, for for uh, South Asia, Pacific Asia. For Latin America and things like that, and because there is com going to be commonality, and then every country then localizes, then that's something that the One Future Alliance is looking at. I, I do want to leave it. the The last thing that, if you look at the next four to five years, um, is going to be you know we are all talking about AI in this discussion. AI didn't come up that strongly that I had thought it would, but AI is everywhere today, and one of the core ingredients all of us know apart from the compute and the algorithm is the data. So, so every country is getting more conscious about how to do the control, the data that they are producing, uh, and then, then monetize it for their benefits rather than just give it to large corporations to, to mine it and then sell it back to them in a different format. Uh, so there is, there is that, that definitely is going to be a big, 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 um, thing in when we come to uh, AI and building standards and ethics and you know um, putting more governance around it. So those are the some of the things I think we'll we'll see in the next two to three years at, at max three to four years um, uh, as we go along. I I don't uh, I don't have the crystal ball to look at it again. Thank you. <laughs> well, out of all of us, uh, you have the max amount of power, Arvind. Let's uh, not put it down at all. But thank you so much. This was an enlightening and fascinating conversation. I will hand over to Christine to wrap this up. Well, thank you, Priyana. That was uh, a really fascinating um, discussion. And I think everybody will have learned a lot. Um, certainly the sophistication of um, the technology in both countries um, is quite astonishing. And to learn uh, the uh, story of um, the global public infrastructure um, repository, the Indian stack, um, New Zealand uh, taking property valuation and um, you know a streamlined system to India and then it leapfrogging from there with innovation. Ahmed laying laying down the gambit to uh, you know let's do more with agri technology to um, to um, really eradicate world hunger. Um, these are amazing things. So I think there's a lot um, for everyone to digest, and I really encourage you uh, to reach out and to. Uh, you know, follow what has interested you in this conversation. There's a lot to unravel. So with that, I would really like to thank the panel um, for each of you for um, uh, being here this evening and being um, and, and morning, uh, in morning in India um, and really um, bringing this topic alive. And I think it's really only the beginning. And um, we do look forward to the uh, next in this series. Um, so have keep a watch out for that. Um, and Indrani, <laughs> thank you again. Hi. It's just been a pleasure um, to work with you. Um, Priyana and Kartika, who has her um, video off. But um, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank from you. the Ananta Aspen Center, thank you all very much. And um, really grateful for this conversation, which is absolutely super. So honored. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. That was so <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Thank you.